Well, good morning, Mac. Welcome to our online service. My name is Stafford Greer. I'm the lead pastor here at Morden Alliance Church. And while our province remains in the critical red zone, we're going to be coming to you uh, through just digital means. We know that we need to make sure that we are doing our best to keep people safe. And that means being distant from each other during this time again. But either way, we are so glad that you are a part of watching with us today and I encourage you to take part in the chat on YouTube that's happening right now. Uh, say, hey, where you're from, where you're watching from, we would love to, uh, to connect with you in that way. One of the things that we've done here at Morden Alliance Church is that we have a very rich history of supporting international work. Now, in the Christian and Missionary Alliance, our denomination, uh, when we send people overseas to, to spread the gospel globally, we want to make sure that they are funded. And so we have a, uh, a global advance fund, which helps ensure that our international workers are able to stay out on the field proclaiming the gospel. But we also know that there are a couple times where we need to kickstart brand new projects and help get new international workers out in the field. And for that, our denomination has started the Jaffrey Project. So I'd encourage you just to watch this short little video to kind of give you a heads up of what the Jaffrey Project is. And then I'll come back around and I'll tell you how you can be involved. When I was 16 years old, I was focused on school, working a part-time job, and spending time with my friends. I believed in God, but I wasn't willing to be radical. When Robert Jaffrey was 16, he gave his life to Christ, and shortly after that, he was mentored by the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, A.B. Simpson. Jaffrey had a burning passion for missions, which led to conflict at home. His father owned one of Canada's most successful newspapers. Robert Jaffrey Sr. intended to pass his money, influence, and power onto his son, but only if his son chose not to pursue missions. Jaffrey faced an ultimatum, and he chose to follow God. In his 20s, God led him to China. Jaffrey and his colleagues led many people to faith in Jesus in the Guangxi province, and they planted churches in the Wuzhou areas of China. In his 30s, Jaffrey launched a venture into Vietnam. Today, the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Vietnam has more than 1 million members and over 550 ordained pastors and over 2,500 churches. There are people all over the world who are eager to hear more about God. The Jaffrey Project sends international workers to least reached people groups, such as the Fulani, Wolof, Yazidi, this annual campaign launches new workers and supports the Global Advance Fund so we can keep expanding the kingdom. This is our fifth year hosting the Jaffrey Project. In that time, Jaffrey offerings have exceeded $1 million and helped our international workers begin direct engagement with 11 additional people groups. This year, the Jaffrey Project is targeted to raise at least $250,000 to send international workers to the Tuareg, and Fulani in Western and Central Africa, the Aziri in the Middle East, and to establish a presence in South Asia. COVID-19 has affected every one of these places. The means, the logistics of sending are much more difficult. But it also means the need has never been greater. Together, we can meet this need. COVID-19 has also impacted our churches here in Canada. In response, this year's Jaffrey resources are geared toward online ministry, with online giving at the forefront. To make the Jaffrey Project a reality for you, give your Jaffrey gift through your Alliance Church or directly at cmacan.org. We're confident that once again this year, we can come together to reach people in places where few or none have heard. Well, there you have it. That's a brief overview of what the Jaffrey Project is. And we're going to show you a couple more videos over the next few weeks that help tell stories of what is happening in uh, global missions in the Christian Missionary Alliance.
As a church, we have set a goal of raising $5,000 for the Jaffrey Project this year. And you can give directly online going to mordenalliance.ca. And if you are a regular giver, you can choose the giving tab and you can click there and make a donation and just type in the comments where you'd like the money to go if it's to the Jaffrey Project. Uh, or if you would like to support the Jaffrey Project directly, there's also a link through our events uh, page on our website and you can give there and there's a little there. It shows you how much we have given, what our goal is and more resources about the Jaffrey Project. So I want to thank you guys for supporting global missions and keeping our international workers both on the field and helping fund new work to happen globally during this time. Uh, of COVID. This is a special season where we can help make sure that the gospel continues to advance in the least reached people groups. The other thing I'd like to remind you of is there's two areas. One is the angel tree. We're getting close to the deadline of when we need to know who can be a part of the angel tree. Again, go to our events tab on our website and let us know how you would like to be a part of it. I know for our family, we have three kids in our family. And so we have chosen to sponsor three children ourselves. Uh, and I would encourage you in that same way, whether it's kids or grandkids, whatever it might be, let's make sure that we are blessing uh, blessing kids and making them know that they are not forgotten during this Christmas season. And finally, happening this week on Thursday evening, I'm going to be hosting an online membership class. And I know many of you have begun to join our services either digitally or in person over the last year to year and a half. And I'd love for you to invite you to the membership class. Now, showing up to the membership class does not automatically mean that you must become a member. And I'm not going to force anything on you. But this is a great time just to connect with a few other people who might also be new to our congregation and find out what does membership actually look like here. Uh, we might view membership pretty differently than maybe another experience you may have had with church membership. Either way, it'd be great for you to do that. Again, you can find more information by clicking on the events tab on our website. But now, why don't I throw this over to the, uh, the worship team and we will have a few songs of worship there. days are dragging by 
August clouds will melt away when he breaks through. Again, this is the time of the service where we take time to pray. Uh, and we know that as we enter back into a critical red zone, there's lots of anxieties and worries that we are all carrying. And know that this is not just unique to us, but also it's worldwide too. And so during this time, I'd like to pray for our international workers in the desert sand region, r and and also for uh, Tabor Home today and the, uh, the chaplain who's there, Gerald Newfeld. Both of these things are, uh, are experiencing hardships and trying to navigate a very hard situation. And with Tabor Home, vulnerable people and R&M who oversee uh, all of the desert sand region, uh, working with teams and trying to coordinate things there. So uh, join with me in prayer for them today. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you that even though we are nervous, uh, you are not. Uh, I thank you that even though we are caught off guard with life and situations and health and fears, uh, you are not. And we thank you that the good news is that you are with us even when we are terrified and worried. 
And so today I pray for, uh, for Tabor Home and all the residents that are there and the families of people who are, who are there and for Gerald who's trying to provide pastoral care to the residents. There's just so much worrying and, and fear that can happen uh, with things going in lockdown. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you are very present there with them during this time. Give Gerald the real uh, presence and peace of your spirit and everywhere he goes. And that family members worried about their, their family in Tabor are able to find ways to connect and not feel isolated during this time. And I pray for R&M who oversee all of the desert sand region for the Christian Missionary Alliance. I pray that you give them wisdom and peace as they navigate what lockdowns and restrictions mean and trying to coordinate their team and people who are coming in. And also for themselves and being away from home um, we just pray your peace and your comfort on them, that they might see you and see fruit from their ministry that maybe are only bearing fruit because of the season that we're in right now. I pray you give them peace and wisdom. And I pray for us here as a church as well. Heavenly Father, I pray that you come and you meet us in the midst of our fear and our grief and our anxiety and the things that are happening all around us, and we wonder what this might look like, and, and how, do we, how do we cope with things. And for those who have lost loved ones, Jesus, I just pray the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, comes and, and comforts them. And for those who are fearful, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just drive away the spirits of fear and anxiety. And I pray instead you replace it with your peace, Jesus. Uh, Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Heavenly Father, thank you for how you have sent your Son to save us. We pray all of this in your name, Jesus Christ, the only name that can save. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. As you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Say he can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, you can move the mountains, God you are mighty to save, you are mighty to save forever. Salvation, you rose and conquered the grave.
grave Jesus conquered the grave Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King The Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save Well, hey, good morning once again. Welcome to my home. Uh, I really love hosting people, uh, but I think it's going to be a little hard for me to do that in the traditional way uh, for the next little bit. So I thought I'd get to invite you in this uh, unique way that we get to do this here. Hey, we're going to do something a little new uh, for this next little while. We want to make these times that we have together a bit more interactive. So a few times throughout our discussion today, a question is going to come up on screen with a small timer in the corner. And what we'd love for you to do in that time is to talk to the people in your household, or if you're watching live, you can use the chat box right next to me. And we hope that this will help us engage this topic a little bit better and creates a really good conversation as well. And if you're, if you're at home and you're having a good talk and you want some more time, the time, time we gave you isn't enough, uh, you can go ahead and pause the video, no rush, I'll, I'll still be here. Uh, you guys can come back to it when you guys are done your conversation, no rush, have a good time with that. Let's, let's give it a shot right now. Let's practice this. Uh, here's our first question we're going to talk about today. When I moved to Morden last year, it was my first time I've ever really had my own place. I've rented rooms from people. Uh, I've, for a handful of summers, I spent at a Bible camp uh, where I slept in cabins. But to say that I slept those summers maybe is a little generous. Uh, there were six years of my life where I lived in a 13 by 10 foot room where I didn't know how to take care of myself and had to sleep in the same room as a stranger that I was given zero background information on. Uh, it's otherwise known as a college dorm room. Uh, but summer of 2019, I moved into my first apartment here in Morden, and in order to establish for myself that I've truly become an adult, I made a goal for myself that I was going to teach myself how to cook. Up until that point, the only two things I really knew how to make were packaged ramen and a bowl of Rice Krispies, so I had a really long way to go. I was telling a friend of mine about this goal that I had, and he told me about this app that he uses called Mealime. And this, this, isn't, this isn't a sponsored sermon. Uh, Meal Lime isn't paying me to say this, but it, it's a really great app. Essentially, uh, they have all of these different recipes. You can choose a handful and build your meal plan for the week. And after you choose your meals, it will automatically make a grocery list of everything you need to make those meals that you chose. And so I'll, I'll get the list. I'll go through it. I'll check off everything that I already have in my kitchen and then head off to the grocery store and buy the rest. And when I get home after grocery shopping, it'll give me uh, full directions on how to cook the meal. Uh, I can adjust how many servings I want to make. I, it gives me the average time it'll take to cook those things. It's there for me every step of the way. It's fantastic. But uh, as great of an app as this is at holding my hand in the kitchen and babysit me, um, it's a sort of a problem has kind of emerged with it. Where up until recently, unless I had the recipe right there with me, I had zero idea of what I was doing in a kitchen. And maybe you're like that too. Maybe not with food, but maybe uh, you pick that new piece of Ikea furniture and you need to follow it step by step. Or maybe uh, you have a very specific problem with the device you own and you just need to find that guide online that will give you that, that exact the solution to the exact problem that you have. Maybe you're one of those people who when you leave for a trip, you have to outline very specific instructions on how to get, take care of your home for the person that's looking after it while you're gone. Or maybe you have to put uh, everywhere that you drive into Google Maps because uh, it would be the worst thing ever if, uh, if you took a wrong turn. 
I think there's something, at least for some of us, that's in human nature that makes us feel safe and in control when we have very specific instructions that we can follow. Over these past uh, couple weeks, we as a church have been talking about the Bible. Uh, in week one, Stafford asked the question, how do I handle this thing? Where we looked at exactly what makes up the Bible. In week two, uh, we asked if we could trust the Bible. We dug into some of the historical evidence that allows us to be confident in the Bible we have today is largely the same as the one, the earliest manuscripts that we have, for, for, have been able to find so far. Today, what I want to do is talk about, ask the question, how do I read my Bible? How do I read it? And before we really get into this question, I think we need to recognize that as far as world history is concerned, this is a relatively new question that people who follow Jesus have been asking. For years, uh, no one could just walk into a church or a bookstore and pick up a Bible. Uh, church leaders in the 16th century and before that uh, were really the only people who were allowed to read the Bible. Uh, outside of it just being a way to hold on to power at the time, uh, they believed that regular people just weren't smart enough to understand it. And they just told the people to trust them and that they knew what they were doing and just to let them tell them what the Bible says and let them take care of it. It wasn't until the Reformation in the 16th century where common people were finally allowed to get their hands on their own Bible. So it's only been for the roughly last 400 years uh, that people have ever been really been able to ask how they should read their Bible. For a lot of us, we sometimes read the Bible a lot like a recipe or an instruction manual where if you read it and you follow the steps without question and don't mess up, you'll end up with this great perfect Christian life where you'll be well-liked, you'll have all the money you need, you'll finally lose that 20 pounds, and your kids will never fall into that bad crowd at school. Or maybe you were like me when you were younger and you were taught that the Bible was an acronym for basic instructions before leaving earth. And you know, that's a nice idea. I think it really fits into our North American culture really well to view it that way. But I th if you open the Bible almost anywhere, you can start to see some cracks in that theory. Like take something like Matthew 4.9. Uh, Matthew 4 9 says, I will give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. So yeah, on, on the surface, sounds great. Uh, if you were to open up your Bible, plop your finger down on verse 9, read it, close it back up, and go on with your day, you'd feel pretty good. All I have to do is worship him, and I get everything I need. And that sounds really great until you realize that it was Satan who said that. <laughs> Or uh, maybe uh, look at Proverbs 26, verse 4. It says, don't answer foolish arguments of fools, or you will become as foolish as they are. Again, sounds great. Uh, if you encounter someone who's making a really stupid argument, don't stoop down to their level. Don't uh, pick fights with them. Don't argue on their level. That's great. But then you read the next verse. You read verse 5. It says, be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools, or they will become wise in their own estimation. So obviously you have a problem here. We have two verses right next to each other. Definitely do not answer the fool, but also you should answer the fool. By reading our Bibles as a book of rules to follow, that can cause us a lot of problems. Like, is it multiple choice? Do I pick just one here in Proverbs? In case I haven't upset everyone uh, yet, let me poke the bear a bit harder by questioning the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. In Exodus 20, uh, we see God command the Israelites to do 10 things. Maybe you're familiar with them. You should not have any other gods before me. Don't make idols. Don't misuse God's name. Remember the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness and don't covet. If you grew up like a good, a good Sunday school boy like I did, you're probably familiar with this list. And your mom would let out a little amen when the parent one came on. And, but as I've gotten older, it's, it's been harder to see these as black and white rules. Like, what does it mean to have gods before God? Could I have gods after God? 
And honestly, it's argued that the Israelites did feel this way. Archaeologists have dug up hundreds of little clay figures from Judah, one of the kingdoms of, Is kingdoms of Israel, and likely, uh, it likely represented a Canaanite fertility goddess. It says murder is wrong, but what about self-defense or to protect your family? Or could someone uh, steal in order to save their child from starving? It's clear to me, at least, that the Bible refuses to fit into this idea of a rule book to a perfect life, whether we intentionally or unintentionally give it, to, give it to that or not. So if we can't read it as a rule book, then how can we read it? Whenever we approach the Bible, we need to understand that it's three things. The Bible is ancient, it's ambiguous, and it's diverse. This might sound obscure for some of us, or maybe not the first words that come to your mind. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 calls all scripture God-breathed, and Hebrews 4.12 calls it alive and active, and those are great things, of course. And for some of us, we read passages like this, and uh, words like holy or perfect or clear would be words that might emerge for us. And those words work. Uh, however, what I've also found is a spiritual, spiritual disconnection many feel today stems from expecting the Bible to be this holy, perfect, and clear book, when in fact, after reading it, they find it to be somewhat out of touch, or confusing, or weird, or in some places, it's just morally suspect by today's standard. And what's worse is when people notice these things and ask these questions, there, there are others who minimize their struggles or worse, they make them feel bad by threatening their lofty view of what scripture is. By embracing the Bible as this ancient, ambiguous, and diverse book, we embrace a Bible that challenges us and cheers us on as we make our own spiritual journey. It's one that invites us to risk and go beyond what's familiar to us, and one that gently urges us to see God and see what he's up to right here and right now. So what do I mean by these words? What do I mean by these three things? To say that the Bible is ancient, it might be obvious. As we talked about in previous weeks, even the latest books of the Bible are, are, are pretty old today. But if we forget exactly how ancient the Bible is, if we forget how old it is, really, we forget that the Bible is written to a very distant and very foreign world. It's sort of like this book that I have here. Uh, this is manga. It's basically a Japanese version of a comic book. I thought I'd try it out to see if I'd be into it. Personally, this didn't quite stick with me, but that's not what's important. If you didn't know, uh, like I did my first time reading something like this, is that it reads very differently from most books that you or I might own. That being that you start from the back. Uh, for us in Canada and pretty much every country that has a large European influence, we read books from left to right because that's how our language works. But in, but in Japanese writing, or kanji it's called, is, is written from right to left. So if you went in blind and read this thing like you would every other book, you would start uh, from the end and you'd, you'd be reading it backwards. And a lot like this, uh, the books and letters uh, that make up what we call the Bible today carry their own cultural influence and baggage that we might not understand uh, at, at first, and it causes us to miss out on the true meaning and beauty of what's written in these words in Scripture. A great example of this is found uh, in the first words of Genesis, where we see the word beginning. And almost any study Bible that you have will state that the original writer uh, doesn't describe the meaning, the beginning as, as nothing or as a single moment, but as a dark and wild chaos that's called the deep. And what does the deep mean? Well, I don't know, and that's kind of the point. The writers of the Bible lived long ago and far away, and they were intent on asking their questions and seeking their answers oblivious to the ones that we might have today in 2020. The second word that we use is ambiguous. Kind of like we were talking about earlier, we can't always knock on the Bible's door, yell trick or treat, and expect it just to hand out answers like candy. 
More often than not, what we find is that the Bible seems to refuse to tell us clearly what to do. It like, doesn't tell us what kind of job to have. It doesn't tell us who to vote for, uh, whether or not we should play basketball or volleyball. And maybe the question we should be asking is why it seems so much uh, that the Bible is unclear at first glance, but it's still for us alive and active. Lastly, last thing is the Bible is diverse, meaning that it doesn't speak with just one voice. And this might uh, cause some of us to withdraw because, like we mentioned before, uh, that, the, that the Bible is God-breathed. And uh, traditionally, we understand that God is one God. And I would, of course, that's, that's the case. But uh, like Stafford had mentioned before, the Bible was written by various writers who lived at different times, in different places, and under different circumstances, who wrote, who wrote for different purposes. These contexts influenced what they wrote about and how they wrote it. And if we believe that God's word is good, we need to believe that this diversity is good as well. And please hear me say this. I I don't want you guys to miss this. I'm not calling the Bible ancient and ambiguous and diverse as a way to point out the Bible's weaknesses or to show you the ways that the Bible is wrong. It's not what I'm doing at all. The Bible is God-breathed. The Bible is alive and active. But it's by understanding these ideas that we get to understand and appreciate the beauty of the Bible more and more deeply. Rather than providing us with information to be downloaded, the Bible holds out for us an invitation to join an ancient, well-traveled, and sacred, sacred quest to know God, the world we live in, and our place in it. But this quest isn't going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. When we come across certain points of the Bible that we don't feel belong or frighten us or cause us to ask questions, we might think, uh, we might get worried that they might get us into trouble or it could be tempting to lock them up in a cage and ignore them or maybe just hope that they go away. But I'd hope for us uh, that when these issues do come up, we're not tempted just to shy away from them or or be scared to ask them, but to actually ask these questions uh, and learn to adjust to them. Scott McKnight, he wrote a book called The Blue Parakeet, and in it he outlines three ways to read or approach the Bible. And there's more than three ways, obviously, but I want to look at these three in particular. The first is what he calls reading to retrieve. Some of us have been taught the Bible in such a way uh, that we return the Bible in order to retrieve biblical ideas and practices for today. Uh, sometimes those people uh, who try to retrieve all of it, they try to retrieve everything that it has, but more realistically, they can only really retrieve uh, what could be salvaged. For those who try to retrieve all of it, their attitudes towards Scripture will often have this attitude of, well, if the Bible says it, then we should do it now. So like if Paul wants us to speak in tongues, we should speak in tongues. If Jesus washed feet, we should wash feet as well. If Peter says women shouldn't wear gold jewelry or fine clothing, our women aren't going to wear gold jewelry or fine clothing either. Exodus says the death penalty is proper, so the death penalty is proper for today as well. The goal of reading the Bible this way is to look back at the ways God's early people uh, lived, retrieve all of the ideas, no matter how uncomfortable or politically incorrect, regardless of what it might cost us, absorb whatever we think the Bible teaches us, and live out all of it. And there are some problems to this approach. Namely, it's next to impossible to live a first century life in 2020. Uh, Rachel Held Evans, she wrote a book called A Year of Biblical Womanhood, in which she shot to spend, uh, spend a year living out the different qualities Protestant churches often describe to be a perfect godly wife in Proverbs 31. And uh, she just showed just exactly how uh, difficult or next to impossible it can be, and also how misused that proverb often is. That was then, this is now, might be a slogan used by parents to dismiss their kids' questions sometimes. 
But when it comes to the Bible, it's sort of reality. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19, 23, Paul lays out his strategy of constantly adapting how he taught the Bible in new cultures. In verse 20, he states that when uh, he was with the Jews, he lived like a Jew to bring Jews to Christ. And when he was with Gentiles, he lived like Gentiles so that he can bring them to Christ. If Paul was already adapting a first century Jewish ideas to first century Gentile situations, I think it's completely fair that we do a similar thing in our own context. So should we be looking uh, back at how the people in ancient Israel uh, lived and force ourselves to live the exact same way? To quote Paul, no. Will we have the New Testament, our first century expressions of the gospel and church life? They're not permanent, timeless expressions. They're for that particular group in that particular time facing their particular situations. We're not called to live first century lives in the 21st century. We're called to live 21st century lives as we walk in the light of an ancient, ambiguous, and diverse revelation God gave to his people in the first century. This has happened all throughout history, even in the not-too-distant past. The founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, of the denomination that NAC belongs to, wrote a book on healing, and in it, he argues that Christians shouldn't seek medical help when they're sick and simply trust that God will divinely heal them. He says this, he says, God has nowhere prescribed medical means, and we have no right to infer that drugs are ordinarily his means. If we were told this belief today, we wouldn't be taking any precautions for the pandemic, obviously. And if anyone were to get sick, we'd be discouraging any kind of medical assistance and simply pray their sickness would just disappear. But obviously, we don't hold that view. Please go get your flu shot. We don't hold that view. Because back in A.B. Simpson's day, uh, medicine hasn't evolved to to the place that it has today. And hospitals weren't so much places people uh, thought they can get better in, but more just places that they can go to comfortably die. Over time, as a denomination, we've discerned that how the Bible spoke to Simpson in his day wasn't how God was speaking to us today. And so we now believe that God has called and equipped individuals who are way smarter and way more patient than I am uh, to uh, to serve their community's medical needs. People sometimes read the Bible to retrieve, which isn't quite the biblical way. The second way the Bible is often read is is through tradition. There are two types of tradition that I could be talking about here. There's often what's called great tradition and the traditionalism. Great tradition are the ideas of scripture that are essential to understanding the Christian, Christian message. You and I can have discussions and disagreements over how old the earth is or what age you need to be to get baptized, but that doesn't change the central idea like how, what Jesus did for us or how this Holy Spirit works in our lives. Great tradition is core beliefs and doctrine that have existed, for, have existed since Christianity began, and without them, it's no longer Christianity. Great tradition is, is good. What isn't good is traditionalism. Traditionalism is a super strict, don't ask questions, this is how it's always been done approach to the Bible. There's usually six steps that happen uh, when you read the Bible through traditionalism. The first is that we confront the, we read the Bible. Uh, the second is that we confront a current issue and we make a decision about it and make, a, make it a belief statement like Simpson did with medical care. Then the third thing that we do is that uh, this decision becomes ingrained into our tradition. Then number four, uh, we end up bound to this tradition somehow for a really long time or forever. And then fifth, we, we go back and read the Bible through this belief that this tradition that we've established is essential. And then what ends up happening uh, in step six is we cast judgment on those who question this tradition and then we alienate them from our communities. When Paul was speaking to Gentiles, he didn't bring all of the baggage of Jewish tradition over with him. He understands the core doctrine, the great tradition of who Jesus was, and presented that in their own culture and contexts. It's important to read the Bible with the understanding of core beliefs about Christianity in mind. But I also understand that it's next to impossible for traditionalism uh, or these sacred cows to not creep in. That's why I think it's this third and final way of reading the Bible uh, that we, we're going to look to today is so essential for us as we engage with Scripture today. Rather than reading to retrieve or reading through tradition, we need to read with tradition. 
The Bible is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. So when we read the Bible, we need to be always alive and active with it. What turned Borden into a viable place to put up permanent residency was the railroad that was built here in 1882. Since then, since 1882, we've advanced the society and we don't rely on railroads as much. But if Morden still relied on the railroad as its primary reason for existing, because that's how traditionally people got here, I don't think we're going to be a place that's getting a new McDonald's anytime soon, let alone one with two drive throughs If we're insistent on reading the Bible a certain way, just because that's how it's always been interpreted, we risk missing out on what God has for us here and now. To read the Bible with tradition, we move forward through the church and speak God's word in our days, in our ways. We go back to the Bible, interpret what its contents mean for us today, but we don't fossilize these beliefs uh, where they become these traditions that we idolize, they become sacred cows for us. If the words in this book, in the Bible, are God-breathed, we need to set them loose and let, let it renew who we are. Reading the Bible with tradition gives us guidance, but also gives us permission to disagree with it. We want to have profound respect for past traditions without giving it final authority. Our job as Bible readers is to take the timely events and instructions in the Bible and understand them well so that we can move forward and practice scripture in our own timely events. So this might sound like a lot. When we wake up in the morning and do a devotional or when you get your, your verse of the day on your phone, it feels like a lot of work to have to do all of the background work and understanding historical context and evaluating all of our past traditions. When I read, verse, when I read Jeremiah 29, 11, and I see that God has plans to prosper us and not harm us, I just want to have that nice feeling that God is in control and get on with my day. I get it. I would just hate for us to lose out on the divine beauty that God has for us within the pages of the Bible, just because we couldn't be bothered to sift through what these words mean for us today. The Bible is ancient, it's ambiguous, and it's diverse, but it's also the most relevant thing you could ever own. When you read a passage of scripture, uh, read it in its context of all that's happening. Things like the genre of the book or the author are pretty important. Stafford in our first week went over those and, and there's a lot of resources to understand these online as well. Before I started the book of the Bible, before I start a book of the Bible recently, I really enjoyed watching the Bible Project's overviews of each book on YouTube before I start to dig in. They do a great job of outlining some of this, some of the historical context at the time and also looking through really essential themes for these books. I highly recommend them. We're going to include a link uh, to a playlist of all those videos in the, in the description here. Uh, you can also uh, sit down and read large chunks of the Bible at a time. Aim for something like 30 chapters a week or read through a shorter book like James or 1 John all the way through once a day for a week or just read twice through Mark in, in this next week. These kinds of longer reading times allow us to better see some patterns and themes these books uh, have that we might miss if we only just read a little bit each day. We live in an area that is often seen uh, as oversaturated with Bible or with church culture. And while there are a lot of churches in this area, I would think it's more accurate to say that we live in an area where the population has held on to long-standing traditions and beliefs about God. And while not all of these traditions are bad per se, when we start to read the Bible with tradition in mind, as we seek to shape how God calls us to live today, we'll get to experience God in a whole new revolutionary way. 
You'll find new ways to love your neighbors and your family and your classmates. Not only will this change you from the inside out, but as we start to explore fresh ways God has called us to love Him, ourselves, our neighbors, people will start to notice. Others will start to have, find fresh new ways to love Jesus in their own world because of what you've done for them. And those who once felt that the Bible just wasn't for them will see it in a whole new fresh way through you. Even when we're locked away for this next month at minimum, revival in Morden is possible. And God, through his word, invites you to discover your role in this. Well, hey, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, we love being a part of your week in this special way. Uh, if you have some prayer requests, obviously, uh, with how this last week has transpired for us, uh, things uh, look, a, look more uncertain <laughs> than you ever have. Uh, if there's any way in which we can we can reach out and pray for you, we have a prayer email that will be uh, probably some here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> we'll love, we send us an email. We'd love to pray and pray for you. We have a whole team of people uh, eager uh, to pray for anything that's going on in your life. Have a great rest of your week. Uh, stay safe. Be blessed, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.